So good evening again, everyone. I'm Carnitra White, a 27 year old, um, I wish I was 27 years old. <laughs> I am a 27 year human service professional. Um, and I've had the privilege of serving in different roles throughout the child welfare system. And I call it the child welfare system. Um, I served in the role of state child welfare director over overseeing uh, all child welfare services for state, as well as a local director of social services. Today, I am representing myself and none, no other organization. Um, and I will be the moderator for tonight's discussion with, with the fine panelists of foster care professionals who you see on the screen today, and they will introduce themselves shortly. First, I want to start off by saying this month is National Foster Care Month, and the national theme is foster care as a support to families, not a substitute to parents. I see as people are logging in, we have a lot of child welfare professionals and foster parents, and so I want to start by thanking each of you for the work you do every day to support families and children in the foster care system and the sacrifices that you make. We want to honor you and say thank you for the great work for all that you do. We appreciate it. Tonight's discussion, we will explore the foster care system, the challenges and the opportunities for improvement, and we'll answer your questions. But first, we have a welcome message from Shane Paul McGee, who played Jamal in the movie. Let's watch uh, Shane's Hi, my name is Shane McGee. I play Jamal Randolph in Foster Boy. Thank you so much for having us and thank you for joining this discussion. Uh, it's been really cool since the film has been released. We've been able to tour and have discussions like these about what's going on and uh, in hopes that we can fix the foster care system. Personally, when I, when I first signed on to do this project, I didn't know much about the foster care system. So um, it was really important to me to be authentic. I didn't want to play a caricature. I really wanted to, to tell the story of Jamal. So I had the opportunity to meet with foster youth, youth in um, First Star. It, it really has shown me the, the hope within the foster care system. We are super grateful to be able to show this film to your community, especially during uh, National Foster Care Month. So we hope that you are moved by this. We hope that you will become an advocate for foster youth in your everyday lives. We want to thank Jamal for his welcome. Um, and uh, I think he said it perfectly. Um, we uh, we want to be authentic in our conversations today um, about the foster care system and how it impacts the lives of children who enter the foster care system. And so tonight we have nearly 2000 of you tuned in into this discussion. And so we're gonna ask you to please send your questions, not in the chat, but in the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, that way we can easily get to those questions. Um, we also will be pulling questions live from our Facebook broadcast. So those who are watching us on Facebook can also submit your questions. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our fine panelists um, who we have today that will be answering some of the questions and also just giving you some insights from their perspective on um, the foster care system. And the great thing about our panelists is they all have different perspectives. They all have different seats um, from where they have sat and seen and worked with the foster care system. So it's gonna be a great conversation. First, we have J. Paul Dattani. Did I say it right, Jay? Close. <laughs> Daratani, Carnitra. Daratani. Jay, I, I practice, <laughs> but Jay. not well. Jay, but Jay is uh, the screenplay writer and producer of Foster Boy. Um, Jay, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what led you to write and produce the film? Um, sure, Karnitra, first of all, thank you. And, and it's an honor to be here with the panel. What great, uh, terrific individuals that we have here today. Um, 
So my name is J. Paul Deratani. I am a writer and a lawyer. And what inspired me to write this is kind of a, a, a merging of my legal career with my writing, two passions that I love. I like practicing law and I've been practicing for about 30 years, although I hate to say the number. And I, about 15 or 18 years ago, I got a case in my office and I had never handled this type of case. I didn't even know quite what to do with it. And then uh, uh, the facts bothered me tremendously and involved a young uh, group of children who are abused in the foster care system. And I managed to win that case, wrote an article, I won it after quite a battle with a private foster care system. And then uh, wrote an article, got another case and another case, and then got the case that inspired this film. And then in the meantime, I, my other passion is writing and acting. And I, and I went back to school for it. And my professor, after I turned something in, said, uh, yeah, you need to turn in something that is more passionate. What, what, uh, what, what evokes your passion? And I said, well, working on foster care cases. And he said, write that, John Schimmel, who was a producer for Michael Douglas, by the way. And so I did, and he showed it to one producer, um, Peter Samuelson, a terrific producer who did Revenge of the Nerds and uh, many, many other movies, some of the Pink Panther movies. And finally, um, it made its way to the great, amazing, wonderful Shaquille O'Neal. And we've produced this, this film. And so it's sort of a combo of both my worlds. And, and uh, I'm very happy and, and pleased that it got made. Thank you, Jay. We're excited um, and happy that you did produce the film. I think it it um, is going to spark a lot of conversation, a lot of interest in the foster care system. I uh, hope so. Yeah, thank you. Well, we can see by the number of people who are tuning in today. So yeah. <laughs> Next, we have Karen Baines Dunning. And Karen is a former juvenile court judge. Um, Karen, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and your experience with the foster care system. And also, uh, what was your takeaway from the movie and um, particularly the role that the court plays in the foster care system and how it impacts the outcomes? Wow, uh, happy to be here tonight with everybody. And um, Karen Baines Dunning, as Karnitra mentioned, I was a juvenile court judge in Atlanta. Um, but I, like Jay, I started off, I uh, was working in a big law firm, uh, took some pro bono case in juvenile court and fell in love with my clients. And so I moved over uh, from private practice to start the CASA program. I see there's a lot of CASAs that have joined us tonight. So shout out to the CASA volunteers and um, was appointed to the bench. And from there, it's really been a journey for me. I became a foster to adopt parent um, I then moved into policy work, trying to figure out ways in which we could prevent families from ever having to get to a juvenile court. Uh, taught, I have um, done a number of things uh, with foster care, child welfare, and at the college level, I've had the honor of working with college students who have experienced foster care uh, and really helping build a set of supports uh, and caring adults around them as they traverse higher education. And so now I serve as the monitor for the foster care system in the state of Georgia uh, that is continuing to improve its own system. And so I'm excited about the movie, excited about this discussion, uh, especially during foster care month, um, because there is so much about the system that many people don't realize. Um, when I watch the movie, one of the things that I left with is there are some very, um, you know, not, not good companies, right, that are in this foster care system. And at the same time, I don't want us to miss the opportunity to do some self-reflection. Uh, for those of us that are in and around these systems, how can we make it better? Uh, how can we uh, enable children to be less traumatized if they do have to come into the foster care system. So I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight, thanks. Thank you, Karen. And next we have Matthew Wallach, who is the president and CEO of Ennoble. Ennoble. Matthew, why don't you introduce yourself and would you also um, let us know from your perspective, what you thought the overarching message from the movie was about the foster care system? 
Oh man, that's 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 quite a question. I love it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Matt Wallach. I am actually a third generation social worker. Um, my grandpa founded one of the original foster care agencies in Michigan, and my parents went on to found a, a large child welfare uh, and foster care agency in Michigan as well. So um, I then went on to found a foster care and adoption uh, technology firm because I, like was pointed out in the movie, um, you know, paper trails aren't can't always be followed, but um, you know, the closer we get with technology, the greater transparency that we can have and better understanding uh, of what's happening here. But you know, for me, what what the movie really represented for foster children, and this is something I, I think everyone is familiar with, is once you enter the foster care system, there is going to be multiple, multiple traumatic events that continue to occur in your life. And those things are sometimes far out of your control. Um, and the people that are here on this panel and, and um, listening to this call, we are the people that can have the voice, can be the direct impact and change. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we as a group need to understand that every child that enters this system is, is as soon as they enter this system is gonna face mass amounts of trauma um, and, and all we can do is love and support and, and provide, you know, the best resources that we can. You know, Matt, you point out a good point about the trauma, and I hope we get into some conversation about the trauma that um, not only children, but families face when they enter the foster care system. Um, I would beg to say that the whole family experiences trauma. And next um, on our panel, we have Molly Tierney. Uh, Molly currently serves as the child welfare industry lead for a Central North America public sector practice. Uh, Molly, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us after viewing the movie, what were your initial thoughts and how it related to your own personal experiences? You have years of experience in, in working with the foster care system. I appreciate that. Thanks, Carnitra. So, um... I'm a lot like Kearney and Karen. I've spent my whole career in uh, public, in and out of public child welfare systems, 25 years in a handful of jurisdictions and um, were grateful for the opportunity to serve. Uh, and it was deep into my career, I also became a foster adoptive parent, which gave me a really new perspective on how we treat and care for kids and families in these systems. And I was so moved, as you noted, Karinja, I was very moved by the brilliant expression of the impact of trauma on people. How it is not an event that happened to us once, but it's something that's in and around us all the time. That was really helpful to see. And I also know it makes us, we have really strong reactions to it when we see that kind of something that's that evocative. And I note, that when we something happens to children and we feel very strongly about it, we as a culture are very quick to try to find someone to blame, right? We're very quickly to, to retreat and to vilify someone, like vilify the system, vilify the judge, the caseworker, the foster parent, the, I, the list goes on and on. And I think it's so important if we're really talking about making change is to not slip so easily into that. Because here's what I know after now going on 30 years in the field, and I've seen child welfare now all across the country. It is full of very dedicated people who get up every day to stare down some of the hardest stuff that happens to kids and families in this country. It is not a body of people who get up every day and can't wait to go do damage to some kid and their family, right? And so I just think it's so important that we hold that that is true and it's not going like we want it to go. It's not, it's not resulting in the thing we want it to result in and therefore what should we do? And I suspect if we went at that, we, we wouldn't start by blaming someone. Very good, very good. So thank you, I'm excited to be able to moderate this discussion. As you can see, there's gonna be exciting um, discussions this evening from our panelists. And let me just start with a question um, 
just to kind of pick up on what um, Molly um, was saying about the fact that there are ways to improve the system and that we all play a part in improving the system. So I will post this to each of our panelists to say, uh, like, all for, uh, like all systems, the foster care system has challenges as well as opportunities for improvement. What would you say would be the greatest opportunity for improvement? And let me start with um, Matt. The greatest opportunity for improvement. Um, you know, I think right now it's um, truly a lack of communication and lack of understanding between different parties, um, including the family, the court systems, the, the foster care systems. And that often creates significant problems between treatment services and the well being of the entire family. Um, and, and I think the greater connection, the greater understanding that we have when we serve children and families, um, it, it allows more appropriate decisions to be made. Um, but you put me on the spot really quick. So somebody else can follow up and then I can re-, re You can come back that. in. Yeah, we're gonna have a, it's gonna be a very <laughs> fluid discussion today. <laughs> Who wants to jump in there? Well, you know, I think I, I do wanna address Matt's point and also I think Molly's point because Molly makes a good point. We don't wanna vilify people. And I think that the film tries to, for example, I didn't wanna vilify foster parents because, uh, you know, I'm throwing out a statistic and I have no idea. I would say 80, probably 90% of foster parents are good people. But there are a couple villains and, um, or at least some groups that need to be out of the system. I don't believe privatized foster care is a, is a good system, privatized. And I'm not talking about not-for-profit. I think that when I've dealt with one company that was started in New York by 11 guys, dudes who are, um, in 46 states or were in 50 states, I think, but now I think they're actually down to 26. They've been kicked out of Texas and Illinois. I don't want to say the name of the company because I could get, because uh, I've, I've had cases against them. But when the system is private and you have a, for, a pay system that says you're going to get paid per placement, meaning if the placement fails, you get another couple thousand dollars, the incentive is for placements to fail. And when politicians enter into contracts like that, and when privatized companies get contracts like that, I think it's wrong. I, I, I do. I think that uh, there's room for non-for-profits, but they, even there, we have to be very careful because oftentimes I've seen in my depositions and cases, non-for-profit folks where the CEO is making four or five, six hundred thousand dollars a year, and they're paying the social workers and the hard workers like Matt, like these folks, $12, $15 an hour, $17 an hour, $20 an hour. So there's some, you know, low hanging fruit. Get rid of privatized foster care, in my opinion. Start paying uh, the right wages for the, I don't want to even say the lower end worker, the, the, the boots on the ground workers. Make sure that they're social workers. In one deposition, I asked a young woman what her training was to care for kids specifically with disabilities, and she had been a beautician. No, no offense to beautician, they cut great hair. I love mine, uh, my stylist, but not, uh, they don't belong in a child care or child advocacy area. So I do think that there is, there's room for improvement, but there's also, it's time that we start taking an active role in saying what's wrong in foster care and making sure we, we pick off that low hanging fruit and, and solve these easy problems. And then we can address some of the bigger problems as well uh, down the road, but at least let's let's do the the, the first things first. That's my. View. I don't disagree with you, Jay. Actually, I, I agree with you vehemently on that. That there's some stuff that we should just not be doing any longer in child welfare systems. Yeah, and, you know those are great examples. As people shouldn't be. I mean, this that all that money's out of the mouths of babes, and you and I both know it. And so that we should summarily dispense with yeah, it. Yeah, I know. You do. And, and, I, and I agree with you on that whole point about, um, you know, we can't vilify the good people in the system. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And I thought actually your film did a great job of that. I and mean, one of the things that I appreciated so much of it about it is that Jamal's foster parents were his real family. Like they, they loved that boy. 
And I, that, that part of the story is so important to me as an expression of that's who's in these systems, right? That they kept showing up for that kid because regardless of what a legal piece of paper said, they imagined that boy was in their family and that's what we're hunting for, right? That is what we're trying to have happen. I guess I feel like, I think this, it is absolutely the case that we should, for instance, dispense with the notion that profit could be made. Um, yeah. Right, totally agree. But I don't think that's gonna be enough, right? I think that oh. we have a function in our country where we're sending caseworkers out to homes with a single tool in their kit bag and that is remove the kids. And I think, and it's what Matt said, once a kid's removed, it's not, you solved one problem, but you created a dozen other problems that are gonna be incredibly challenging. And sort of our country's failure to, to your question, Carnage, is what's the biggest opportunity? The biggest opportunity we have as a country is to get farther up river and find ways mm -hmm. to be helpful to fragile families, regardless of what door they walk in. Cause they're either walking in looking for food stamps or a roof over their head, or they're visiting someone who's incarcerated or they're, I don't, I don't know, or they're dropping out of school or they're showing up, right? They're, they're arriving in these places. And I think, why wow, we're smart enough that well, we yeah, think ways to be helpful to them. Let me stop you, Carnage. So I think you're, I think you bring out a good point around what services that we can provide upstream, particularly mm -hmm. um, uh, preventive services for families, building strong communities, building stronger families. But I want to give Karen an opportunity to, to um, chime in on that uh, initial question about improving foster care. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely um, piggyback on what Molly just said. Um, I also, though, want to bring up that, you know, as a nation, uh, we've had quite a year, right? Um, and not only have we been dealing with COVID, but we've been dealing with the multitude of police shootings of unarmed black men uh, and the racial reckoning uh, that we're all experiencing. And we're, there's a lot of focus on law enforcement, uh, but they are just one system. They're just one system that if you trace it back, there's a lot of, um, systemic racism that was cooked into the system from the very beginning. And unless we're able to unpack that, it's going to continue negatively impacting children and especially black and brown children who are disproportionately showing up in foster care systems across the country. And so I think we have to really think about how we are treating children differently, how we're treating families differently. And it is that front end work. Um, we often see in practice where, you know, if it's a black family, um, they're not only going to ask, is this the father, even though he's sitting here, um, but oftentimes they'll ask for him to be removed from the home in order for the children to come back. So that separation of families continues. Um, there's just a lot of bias uh, decision points from the very first contact all the way through the system. And I have to say that, you know, brilliant casting on the judge um, in the movie and the court system does play a huge role in this. And unlike other court systems, the juvenile court judge is the decider. They're the ones that get to make the decision. There's not typically a jury. There may be one state that has juries. Um, and so it is that judge and judges too have to understand their own biases they have to understand the harm that they do when they first remove a child and bring them into care. That's something you can't undo. We need foster care because some children unfortunately have to be removed from their families. But we really have to put more resources up front and more expertise uh, at the front end. So well said, Karen. I, I just wanted to say the other, what, what Karen pointed out is so true, especially in the legal system. We still have an overwhelming predominance of the lawyers are white, including myself, or I'm half, but, um, and the, you know, the overwhelming majority of children in foster care are black or brown. And often, and that's one of the things I tried to address in the movie is a sort of the B story, as we say, the implicit biases, bias that uh, Matthew had, and I think he played it so brilliantly, um, you know, looking at his hair, thinking about him as a thug, not seeing him, so to speak. And, and it's just, it's, it's so 
prevalent. And I think your point about how black men are treated in a foster care system, I see it time and time again, are you the father? Get, they seem to be rushing to get paternity tests for them versus uh, white males. And it really is an overwhelming uh, bias in the system. I'm not even gonna say implicit, it's kind of an explicit mm -hmm. still system that's, that's, that's uh, gotta be corrected as well. And it, and it translates to the kids coming in the system. And oh, so when absolutely. they're acting out from their trauma, we're criminalizing that behavior. We're not acknowledging that this is trauma that's being uh, exhibited. And instead we're transitioning them to the juvenile justice system. And then they graduate to the criminal justice system. And that's really what happened to Jamal in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Horrible so One more thing I just wanna say 40%, but it's something that we need to absorb all of us. And it still hits me like a gut punch. 40% of the kids who age out of foster care wind up dead homeless or incarcerated within three years. That's a horrific statistic that should not exist in this country. Sorry, I'll talk less. No, I, I think that's a really good point. Now talk, talk is, that's what we're here. We're here to talk. We're here to uh, point out some of the, you know, some of the, the statistics and things that we need to improve and outcomes for um, our children in the foster care system are critical for us to improve those outcomes so they can have better outcomes um, in our system. And so we do have a question from the uh, viewers and the question is about just that outcomes and tracking, tracking the outcomes from nonprofit and uh, profit organizations. Do we have any data that shows what the outcomes are um, from those systems. Does anyone, Jay, you want to take that one? You know, I think it was when we had the practice session, I want to say, was it Molly that talked about some of the statistics on this? I or any, I don't have any data on comparing outcomes for kids in the based on the kind of setting that they're in, whether it's for profit or not for profit, but the, you know, we can be clear the impact of the trauma that brings kids to the threshold of child protection, laid over with the impact of having your life ripped out from under you by being removed from your family, yeah. laid over with the impact of living for as long as you live in child welfare without having a place you really belong mm -hmm. um, is, has a damning effect on measurable outcomes that we think about for children, like, and how are they doing in school? Are they attending? Are they making it to the next grade? Are they proficient in their academics? Um, it has a damning impact on health for them. Their health outcomes are worse, not just immediately, but longer term. You know, we're learning things now about in, the reduction in life expectancy for people who spent any significant years in foster care when they were children, like the, the sort of mounting evidence that this method of healing families is not effective. <laughs> this back to my earlier point, Jay, I don't think just saying, oh, well, let's boot the for-profit providers. I think the method in and of itself is not an effective way. And I imagine if you could roll back the film, not literally, but figuratively to meeting Jamal as a little boy and ask him what would help right now that he'd be, he even as a little boy when it would have been able to say, if they could just do this, this would help me a lot right now. And we're just not doing those things. We're not, we're not, yeah. we're not zeroing in on things that would have high impact on a kid's schedule for the children being served by these systems. Well, and I, it's a hodgepodge, isn't it? Um, but Molly, I mean, you, you have different states that have different standards. You have the best interest of the child in some yeah. states and you have family reunification in some states. Um, you know, and there's biases based upon on that. And, and I think, you know, one of the things I do think we need is to figure out a national standard that sort of applies to, that we can apply and look at for, for all of the kids in, in the foster care system so that we're, we're applying a, a system that's rigorous and that's been looked at a, a little bit more in depth. I don't think that the, the, this patchwork of 50 different systems and even tri tribal systems is working at all. 
Yeah, and in many states, or in person. What's and Jay, in many states, it's not just 50 and, and tribal nations, it's yeah. also counties. Every county runs it differently yeah. in different states. That's right. But That's there's right. also a different level of accountability for providers. Um, and so some states have moved to um, performance-based contracting with providers where they're actually looking at outcomes. And we can probably pull up statistics on what organizations are having positive outcomes with children and others are not. And there's this horrible term in child welfare. I think it's horrible. And it's a room board and watchful oversight. That's what, that's what people are accountable for. That is like the floor of being a substitute parent or a parent, right? We should, we should have higher expectations uh, for those that are caring for our kids. I agree. I totally agree with that. I think that the, the whole system, not, not just having this, this patchwork system with uh, 50 different states and counties and, and so forth, but when you're talking about making change, one of the things that some of the bad actors have done is hid behind the privacy laws, whether it's a Juvenile Justice Act or HIPAA and so forth. So the earlier question about the statistics, it's very hard to get statistics. It's very hard to learn. Even when we file a case, it's very hard for me to get some of the records because they'll say <laughs> of my own client, which is an injured party or something, will say something like uh, the, the opposition will say, well, that's private. We can't give you those records. And it, it, it becomes very difficult to, to obtain it those records. It goes back to that lack of communication and transparency of systems and, and truly not knowing what's, what's happening to the child and what's supposed to happen to the child. Yeah. Yeah. And family, excuse me, and everyone involved. I don't mean to, but to, to your point, it, it's when people start guarding this, this guarding this information, it, it, it becomes very scary and it creates the situation that we saw in the movie. And, and let's be honest, we all know everyone on this is the movie is not far off from the reality of situations that children are living and or have lived worse situations because things have been hidden for, for whatever terrible reason. Sorry, that's not. Yeah, it is, it, it is based upon true stories. It's it's basically one story and then mixed in a little bit of other story. And there's a little bit of fiction, obviously, for dramatic. But it is it's it's the real cases. So yeah, I, I do think we have um, that leads us to a question, Molly. I know you've worked in, in public as well as uh, private foster care systems and some of the work that you've done to kind of improve the transparency around. Um, foster care and the transparency of the background of the children that we are placing in various homes. You want to talk a little bit about um, some of the strategies that you employed in your practice and how we can um, maybe think about those on a national level? Yeah, it's such a good question of how do we think about information sharing. I... Uh... I think that there's something really important about repositioning biological parents at the decision-making table. And that's because the fact that we haven't, they're the first, they're the first in line for people we're gonna keep information from because they can't be trusted, right? So we've begun our work in, in, under, under some kind of secrecy. And so I think if we imagined that what we were doing was creating partnerships across foster parents and biological parents, across private agencies and state agencies that had a clear, a clear result they were reverse engineering from. Their result being this kid is gonna have a permanent family they can call their very own in very short order and we're gonna do this on the kid's schedule. That, would, that kind of approach helps everyone step into their own role with deeper understanding of their purpose for showing up, up at the table. So according to the differences, if a foster parent, for instance, believe it's their job, I'll take a kid in and I'll see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I'm just gonna send the kid back. That's really different than a foster parent who believes, uh, -uh it's my job to love this child as my very own and also to bind myself to that child's biological parents. So come hell or high water, we're trying to get that baby home, right? And the, the, I think repositioning to those kinds of partnerships takes away the convenience of, I can't share the information, secret. 
confidence we can't share. Right. That, that by definition, we're not in partnership when we're in that stance. So I think that's a really good point about partnership. Right. And so I think all of the systems working together have to partner. So we all have sat in different places in the, in the child welfare system and the foster care system. And I say the child welfare system because I see foster care as just one piece of the continuum of child welfare. Um, and so we've all sat in different places of the child welfare system. And that partnership becomes really important, not just the partnership between the uh, foster parent and the biological parent, which is a, a, a true partnership, but also the partnership between the agencies and the foster parents between the social workers and the children, between the social workers and the families. Let's talk a little bit about what that would look like in an ideal system of how we could partner together around, and someone put this in the chat, a question around the child's rights versus other rights. So not the rights of the foster parent, not the rights of the parent, but the rights of the child and focusing on what's right for the individual child. And sometimes that can be tricky because everybody has a different perspective on what's right for the child. Who wants to take that one on? Well, I can tell you one opinion I have is if, if I'm, and this may not always be a popular opinion. I think it's uh, the best interest of the child should be the standard. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we, uh, naturally there should be an attempt for family reunification. I'm very much in support of that, but whatever is in the best interest of the, of the child, uh, understanding uh, Molly or Karen, I forget if it was Molly or Karen, who made the earlier point that sometimes you remove a child and you open many other doors. Um, but I, I think that we are not, we don't, we, again, we don't have a nationalized standard. We're not looking at what the child's interests are. The other thing is we don't have a real advocate CASA is wonderful and they're trained, you know, the, the, these are folks that are uh, undergoing some training and so forth. And in some states we have GALs in other states, we don't have a very good GAL system, guardian ad litem for people who don't know that who's, uh, but, and I think another easy uh, low hanging fruit, so to speak, is that each child should be afforded a GAL and there should be a strong rigorous CASA system in each state. So that, that that's my thought on that. Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I love, you know, I, I'm started with CASA, um, but yeah. I also believe that when we talk about the child's best interest, who gets to define that? Yeah. Um, because I, unfortunately, I've often seen where it got down to comparing a pre-adoptive home where they were sending the kid to French lessons and dance and they could afford all these things to the birth home and they had finished their plan and they had done everything that they could do. Um, and that kind of comparison should never happen. Um, many kids, when they do age out of care, what I, what I found uh, when I was working in the system directly is that we, we went out of our way to protect children from their biological families, keep them away, these are bad people. Uh, but when, we, when they turned 18 and they aged out and we were like, okay, good luck, they went back to that family. And so those, those years, even if they couldn't live with them then because of the circumstances, we should have been partnering, as Karnitra said, to help that young person be able to navigate whatever was happening in the family in a way that when they do return on their own or through a court system, they'll be able to do that. I think the other thing is that we often don't involve the biological parents, relatives, uh, the father's side of the family at all. Um, but we often don't involve them in the services and interventions that are happening when a child is in care. And so, uh, of course, when they go home, there's, the like, there's some likelihood that they could return. But if you've been involved with the process, you know what the child's needs are, you know how trauma has impacted them, that better equips you. Like the same way that we equip foster parents, we should be equipping relatives and families and kin and, and all of those natural people that the child already knows. Karen, so, you make a good point on that. I, and and we, when you say best interest of the child, we gotta be careful. We're not just saying economic because you're a hundred percent right that so often that we're, we're ignoring because there has to be a leg up always 
or if you're putting it on the scales, as I like to say, there should always be a little bit of a, uh, you know, more on the scale with returning a child to the biological home because that's their, their biology and everybody loves, you know, no matter what, sometimes a mother can be poor or abusive or, or uh, I, mean, I shouldn't say poor in the same sentence as abusive, but I mean, abusive or angry or otherwise, but then they get help and they're, they can be wonderful. And, and we've got to look at that. And because a child does naturally always want to be back with their mother and father, mother, especially, I think. And another way to say that, Jay, is a mother or father could be dealing with their own trauma. That's right. And they often are, aren't they? We yeah. find that they usually are. And if we can get the right services to them and spend, and I usually hate to say so brazenly, but we need to spend some real money, right? I mean, as our great producer, Peter Samuelson always repeats, who I think is on this, um, and his is a brilliant mind on this. And also with uh, First Star, he always says, the children don't have a lobby. They don't have the, the way to go to Congress and say they have no money. They don't have a lobby. They don't have uh, advocates out there in the congressional system to fight to get some real money uh, in the foster care system. Not that money is the only answer, but it certainly would help a lot more. I think, Paul, that... Um... Jay, that you're hearing Karen and I agree a lot on this way of thinking about child welfare and boy, we got to get up river and be helpful to biological parents and get kids reunified. And that's sort of, I intuit, that's the field from which we come. And, and I, am, I had this notion when you were talking a minute ago that there's something going unsaid here, and that is some version of this. I think it's important to disaggregate the caseload of children that are in foster care because we act like it's all one homogeneous group, right? And all, most of the data suggests that our country can't tell the difference between poverty and neglect, and that we have a whole bunch of kids who came into child welfare, into foster care, just because their parents were poor, right? And though, like I still sort of think of it that says, well, we got to get the right kids in and the wrong kids out of foster care. They probably never should have come into foster care. And that's who Karen and I are talking about is those kids. Just if all of, get them home, let's help the family and get them home. But I think your film, film asks an equally pressing question. There are some children for whom, I believe it's a much smaller number than the 400 odd thousand that are in foster care right now. But there are some children for whom we need a foster care system because our country has an interest in protecting them from harm. And we need robust, loving, safe, healthy, life-giving places to, to hold them not hold, I didn't mean hold like in prison, I meant hold, right? Um, as we figure out how we gonna get you in a permanent way somewhere. And I think one thing that the film was really clear about is there are things going on inside child welfare systems that aren't making those places safe enough. And while I don't think it's an epidemic, Right, I don't think 90%, just you said, it's not 90% of foster parents with kids are unsafe, but it doesn't matter because if it's 2% of them, that's 2% too many, right? It's sort of, we can't, we can't tolerate right. errors in these systems. And so I just didn't, I, somehow I didn't want that. I feel like it was such an important point you were making and I just wanted to pull them apart and say, and both are true. And I suspect that this group of people would agree to both. Yeah, it, it is true, it both and so are. And it is a complex issue because we can't, each child is a different case, right? We have to look at each child. And so when we say, what's the best interest of the child, quite often it is that they shouldn't have been brought to foster care. You're right. And we see that a lot too, as you're pointing out, Molly, so many of them shouldn't, it, it, poverty is not a reason to bring a child. We need to have the support of services. And again, I, I'm going to hound on that, the money to support the families who are living in poverty to, to so that they can provide, whether they're they're not, they, if they, I have a case right now where the family runs out of food at the end of the month and they're forced to spend the last week or two going to food shelters to try to find, and a child has a peanut allergy, for God's yeah. sake. Most of the food at the food shelters are, are peanut based. So that child, in this case, died of starvation, died of starvation in Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio. So our system is a mess. The fact that a child in the United States dies of starvation, that's not, in that case, it was an intact placement. 
so your point's even more well taken, Molly, on that issue, because it's not even a, a foster care situation. We're not providing the basis of support to recognize and to support so many people who have children. Hopefully this is somewhat changing so, some of the recent legislation, but that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, the recent legislation, uh, some of the recent legislation for in, in uh, child welfare, the Family First Prevention Act. So let's just talk a little bit about that first step in moving stream services to uh, prevent children from coming into foster care and providing resources to support families. Um, anybody want to take that? Matt, you have any thoughts around Family First Prevention Act or Molly? I mean, Family First, as we all know, has, has already significantly <laughs> impacted the way that the system is being run and the system is being looked at. Um, there is obviously a much more concerted effort to, to put families first. I guess it depends state by state, right? Um, as we talked about, there's potentially more privatization, privatization more county run in what's being implemented. But I, I think, um, you know, to Molly's point of, and everyone else's point of bringing the family in talking about both the father and the mother side and making family preservation um, a, a key factor of that. I, I think it's, it's the right first step, but as these changes come to our agencies and to the families being served, I think Jay said it before and I'll always say it for social workers is we, we need some funding and, and some, you know, and some greater understanding of, of how we can help support the, the work that's being done to, to and, and the great requirements and resources that is need to, to bring it there. And, you know, beyond that, I think it, it's, it's the first step in a long road of, of moving forward. Yeah. And so um, we, you know, as we talk about the foster care system and children stay in the foster care system, one of the things that I don't think we have talked about and um, is, when children age out and some of the statistics of children aging out. And I think earlier in the point that Karen made that a lot of times when children leave, they go back home to um, their biological families or to, the, to those who they consider uh, their biological families. And so um, points around how we support young people and prepare them for aging out. I know I'm not sure about any of you, but at 18 or 21, I was not ready to be on my own. Um, and so as we're thinking about the foster care system and, and ways to kind of support young people who have experienced foster care and have now exited foster care, what are some of the things that as a nation we can employ to be a better support to those youth? Well, I think some states are doing it uh, well. And I think, uh, you know, organizations like um, uh, Jim Casey and others who have really poured a lot of support around that population um, realize that they need caring adults in their lives. Um, they need somewhere to go for Thanksgiving. That's home. Um, they need jobs. Uh, a lot of states have now moved to if you grew up or you aged out of our system, we're gonna pay for you to go to any of our state colleges or higher ed. And that should be because the state is their parent um, and should be responsible for that. And I'm seeing more and more states starting to get there. Um, apartments, places to live. I think uh, Jay, you pointed out the, the number that become homeless. Um, but it is that ongoing support that every young adult needs. And you're right. Uh, I wasn't ready at that age, and certainly my kids aren't. I think it's even more delayed now um, in many ways for all kids. And so we really, I love the idea of extended services uh, for children um, so that they can keep apartments and can get that leg up. I love the savings accounts where people are matching if they can save money, we're gonna match it. You can spend it on a car, you can spend it for college, you can start a business. Um, but it is that ongoing, they know somebody that they can bounce ideas off of and they have a network of support around them because every young adult needs that and especially young people coming out of the foster care system. Yeah. 
Karen, I love that you said the state is a parent, so they should be paying for that education. That's true. And in that sense, and it's a point I've made in cases, we are all the parents because we are members of the state. We're all the parents of these children. And so I think the, the, I think it's California and there was one other state, I'm forgetting that maybe it was Oregon that's, that is looking or is implementing a plan where they pay or they uh, at least provide community college education or state college education. Maryland, the state of Maryland. Was it Maryland? I was the state of the state of Maryland. <laughs> Your great state, right? But uh, has done that. under a bushel. I'm pretty sure Carnitra White is the reason that's happening in the state of Maryland. So that is well, wow, Carnitra, and that's amazing. That's amazing, and that's that's one of the ways. I mean, but in some states, and and I don't want to say Illinois does this currently, but uh, some one of the states I recall, a child got 18 years old is out of the system, gets six hundred dollars in a bus, uh, a CTA pass, bus pass for uh, six months. I, you know, that's 18 years old. I wasn't ready to go out in the world. And uh, so many kids nowadays, if they're privileged and, and uh, all of that, and they live in the suburbs, they're, they're sometimes they're living at home with their mom and, and dad at the, the age of 30. So um, we need to provide better transition programs uh, for these kids. And we have to start early not at the point of aging out, because it's great these states are providing tuition, but how many young people can take advantage of that? Because nobody has done the stuff that needs to happen on their education K-12. So they're not even prepared to enter into those yeah. uh, institutions. And so that's there, the rub. Yeah, and I have to give a plug to the program that started by our producer first uh, uh, Peter Samuelson for First Star. That's a great program that helps bring kids starting in ninth grade to college campuses. And just in my experience, seeing some of the kids there uh, at Loyola University here in Chicago, they didn't even, some of the, one, one young woman had never seen Lake Michigan. And I asked her, and this is Chicago, if you guys know, that's Lake Michigan is right there. It's right there. Um, and she lived only two, three blocks from Lake Michigan. And I, I just remember it woke me up to thinking that, my goodness, how isolated she was, how, how um, you know, closed her, her community was because she probably didn't have the, even the option to get out to the lake. And just introducing these kids to a college campus, they become the, blue, the DePaul Blue Demons or the UCLA Bruins or, or whatever. And they take that school spirit and there's a higher graduate, give these kids a little opportunity. And that program I think has a 90 some percent, and Peter will say 90 some percent that go on to college. So you give these kids, these youth a chance and they're gonna show you what they can do. Yeah, it's some of its inspiration, I completely agree and op access. And, access. and then some of it's the practicality, right? Cause if I'm moving from foster home to foster home I'm oftentimes changing schools. And that's going to put me behind uh, in my K-12 education. And so that, that, right. that placement stability, that reunification, that making sure that that's a huge component of well-being for children when they're in care is so vital. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So Karen, I think you, you make a good point around placement stability, but also um, I want to just, uh, we have a question in, in the chat just around um, how we help children unlearn fear and trauma, or, or I would say cope with their fear and trauma, build the coping mechanisms with their fear and trauma um, so that they can move forward. What I, what I do know from my time in foster care, uh, from my time working in, with the foster care system and children foster care is that our foster care children and children in general are so resilient, right? They, they are very resilient. And we saw that even in the movie, Jamal was a very resilient young man. And so how do we help uh, support that resiliency in young people in foster care system? And not only that, change the way we, others, see the children in foster care, right? Because I don't, think oftentimes they don't see themselves as victims, but sometimes we treat them as victims. That's a lot right there. So anybody right. can take that. 
Loving every minute of that question, Carney Turner. As you were posing it, I was <clears throat> reminded of Karen's opening comment where she was saying, these are my words, not hers. She was far more poetic, but it's sort of, you know, take a look in the mirror about what we could do, uh, each of us literally as individuals. And I think that I think that when we say what we could do for those kids, the word that sticks out in my in that sentence to me is those, like they're over there, like they're wildly different than us. And I think, I feel like if there are anybody on this call like me who are parents or live in a neighborhood or I don't know, like those kids want just what we have in our neighborhoods and just want our, what we want for our own children. And what's tricky about it is it's harder to figure out how to be helpful to them because we can't, it's not like they all have tattoos on their foreheads. We can't tell who they are when we walk around in our neighborhoods. And what the world, the noise we get from child welfare agencies are there's a single way to help. We can become foster parents, right? And so I think it would be very interesting for us to be thinking about, well, if I'm just a person in a community, I could figure out the number to my local child welfare agency and say, I'd like to help. I can't become a foster parent, but I'd love to understand how I could be helpful to an older youth or two who needs like people in their lives. And if you're a person on this call who works at a business or owns a company who hires people, you could say, oh, I'd like to give a kid in foster care, an after school and summer job. And I'm not talking about come from my little six week program one summer and I'll see you never. I mean, like I'm gonna hire them when they're 16 and they're gonna work after school and in the summertime. And not only I'm gonna pay them reasonably but they're gonna be in the mix of my company. And I can tell you where I worked. Ah, oh, where I worked when I got married. The people that I worked with, they came to my wedding. They cut my cake. They were at my party. You know, like that, that's how life is. They were there when my mom fell and broke her hip. They were, right? Like they were there when I learned my daughter's first name. Like, like that's how life is, right? I think we could take those children from, they are outside the wall now. They are, if they're growing up in foster care, they are outside the wall of community. And those of us, there are 229 plus five of us, six of us on the call we could bring them inside. And if you bring one of them inside the wall, what's the adage go? You bring a whole generation inside the wall. Great yeah. point. And, and I, I think I'll go. Go ahead. No, go, Jen. Go ahead. No, no, Karnitra, go. And I, I... So Molly, one of the points that I think you uh, brought up there is about the support of teens in our foster care system um, and the foster care systems across the country. A lot of times people uh, sign up for the foster care for to be a foster parent and they want a pretty baby, a nice little baby. And there's such a great need uh, for supportive teens and to be a foster parent um, for teens or a CASA for teens. And so is there anyone on the panel want to speak to that just a, just a little bit? I was just going to say to Molly's question, and you just brought that up so well, Carnitra. I, I, you know, uh, my husband and I recently brought a foster child into our home that's 11, and we're going to seek to adopt him. And it, it's, first of all, it's an, I, I don't feel like I'm missing it. I know, you know, maybe a lot of folks feel like, you know, you got to hold that baby and so forth. I am blessed to have this young man in my life, in our lives. He's a beautiful kid and he is thriving. And by the way, he was on an ADHD medication, which I, I'm not knocking it. Some kids need it, of course, but within a few weeks, I met with a psychiatrist, took him off it. I think a lot of times, you know, these institutions are just throwing drugs at kids. They're a little hyper. They're a little, they're a little what? They're kids. They're 11. They're going to jump on a couch. They're going to do a few things. And he weighed 11 pounds less in three months, he's gained 11 pounds. I mean, so it has enriched our lives in an incredible way and taught me things in an incredible way uh, to bring in. So I encourage everybody uh, of age, especially, you know, um, couples that haven't had kids or that aren't sure, uh, well, I should say they should be sure, but, you know, bringing in an older child can be an enriching experience, an incredible experience. And if you think you can't make a difference, 
you know, as uh, as uh, Jamal's character said, well, he's 11. You're not done being a dad. And I am absolutely looking forward to, and my husband and I, our first day, our first Father's Day in the next month, just to be called dad and have that feeling. So there's so much, there's so much want, and they really do want to be loved. And and there's so many wonderful kids out there. And, and Jay, I want to piggyback on, and I know we didn't bring this up, but siblings, um, just just as you know, important to think about and to open to your home and to understand. And once again, going together about reconnecting with the family and ensuring that the biological family is a part of it. It's just as important to you know keep care and, and treatment together, it, no matter what age or 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 who's involved. Agreed. And, you know, there's questions in the chat around the process to become a foster parent, the, uh, to become a licensed foster parent or licensed agency. So we have several people who've been through that process and people who are licensed agencies. You want to talk a little bit about that to give people who don't know um, what that process is like in order to be um, screened and approved as a foster home or and or license as a foster parent? Well, I know Molly can recite this line in verse, so I'm gonna turn it over to her. <laughs> oh, Jay, sounds like you've done it more recently. Jay, what was your experience like? Well, I'm still in process and, uh -huh. and, and there is a lot of frustration. Yes. I'm with, I was, we're, we're with one agency and then they lost the contract and it's with another agency. And you know there is some paperwork, as you know, Molly and Karen and Kanitra and Matthew. You guys all know that there's a lot of paperwork and uh, things like that, and it can be kind of frustrating when your son or daughter is seeing one therapist and making some progress, and then they switch agencies, and he's suddenly got to see another therapist, and, and you know, so that there's a lot of frustration. But that's why. As, as I say, and when and Kurt says, we're, we're going to be your rocks. So that's why the parent could come in and be that rock for that child. And, you know, you just sort of have to laugh about the fact that the system is a, a bit of a mess and, and have a sense of humor because that's the way you get through. At least that's my way of getting through it. Okay. Who are we meeting today? A new person is, it's right. not an easy system. It's, um, it involves filling out the paperwork to become an adopted or a, a foster parent going through some of the classwork. The classwork is not that big of a deal. A lot of it's common sense, uh, doing a home inspection and all of that. Um, but the journey's well worth it. The journey's well worth it because you have this beautiful, amazing life that is enriching yours and you're hopefully enriching his or her life. And I would say the journey is, I'm sorry, Molly. And Molly, you may wanna point, um, just point out that the journey is also necessary, right? Because they're, we're bringing, we're, vetting or as someone said in 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 the question in the chat is we're vetting persons to make sure that they have the ability and the appropriateness to care for for children so it may be frustrating but um i think it's also a necessary process molly you want to you said it better than i i was that's exactly where i was going this is this is as to the question of safety we keep it, it's safe yeah by giving everybody a real good look under the hood before you can take one of these precious beings into your home. Uh, yes, and this, yeah. the process is important and it's good. I just wish there was consistency for the children's sake. You know, if they're with oh. one agency, I wish they would stick with that agency over the, but that again, I think it's politics and people at the head of it, you know, all of a sudden somebody's contract gets ripped out by, uh, you know, the, the agency or the politicians in charge. And, and it's just unfortunate. That's again, a whole nother discussion or topic, but um, we need to have some consistency with, with the, the programs and with the, the uh, uh, agencies that are, are taking on the children. Yeah, I think it really goes back to, there is a very, very significantly high rate in child welfare turnover. Yeah. Everything that is done, um, and it makes that much harder to understand where you're at in the process um, and, and who you should be reaching out to often. And, and it's a necessary process. To Molly's point, it is the most important process that we could put in, but turnover within that process makes it difficult for everyone. But, but why is that, Matt? I mean, I'm, let me ask you a question. Don't you think 
how much did you pay for your education to become a social worker and how much are you getting paid now? Exactly. Obviously you're doing it because you love kids and your it sounds like you said your father was a yeah, social my worker. grandpa, my mom and, and my grandpa, cousin. And, and, yeah. and I will tell you, Jay, this was one of the most interesting conversations I had getting my uh, MSW. Um, one of our teacher, one of our professors goes, so we're in a child welfare class. What do you guys think you're gonna be making as social workers coming out of this, of this curriculum? And it was the University of Michigan. And the professor looked at me and goes, Matt, what are you guys paying your starting child welfare, foster care social workers right now? I looked at him and I said, well, starting salary is about $32,000 for a nonprofit. And the, and the students looked around and they said, excuse me, what? I did not know, realize. I thought I was getting into, you know, I'm getting into this for the mission and the good. And if we can't afford to pay our social workers, what they need to be paid to pay off that education, that master's degree or that doctor right. or whatever they're doing, it, it, they, they then have to move forward. And we need more consistency with our social workers and with our resources to, to make sure that everyone's having a better experience. And they're burned out. They're giving them 20, 30 cases instead of, even if the DCFS Over, regulation. Yep, 15, Over, overworked. They're overworked. So, you know, if you're paying, what is 32,000 amount to per hour, I, I think- that was, know, that, was, that was 10 years ago. So mind you, that was 10 years ago, but that, you know- well, that, yeah, Maybe it's 34, <laughs> but you know, we're, yeah. we're not respecting the people who are at the front lines. We haven't done that for years. I'm going to say this. I think part of the thing is there's an also an inherent um, sexism in our our treatment of professionals. What do we do? We we pay the most important people what we used to consider to be quote women's jobs, but teachers, nurses, social workers, of course, they're not just women's jobs. But you know, it go, there's a long history of of sexism and misogyny that goes back where we're not paying a fair wage. And I, you know, again, I keep getting into side subjects, but you know, we have to, we have to oh. give people a fair wage and give them the right caseload so that they can, they can want to stay and not get burned out. So I think there is, you know, I think there is an inherent burnout in social work. Some of it is because of the type of work that we do and the work itself, you know, we talk about secondary trauma. A lot of our social workers experience um, secondary trauma from the work that's being done and how looking at ways, and I know many organizations and states are looking at ways to support their um, social workers in dealing with that secondary trauma. Um, I do think you make a good point around, you know, making sure that our social workers are uh, compensated appropriately for their education and their efforts. And as we talked about before, making sure that those who are in the system actually are degreed persons and actually are um, have a background in uh, social work. And so that the services that they're providing are really good for the, the children and families that we are serving in our system. And there's a question from the, uh, from the chat just a little bit around, because I want to get a couple of more questions in from um, our audience. And this question is around uh, foster care allies and advocates in the U.S. House and Senate and the kind of legis um, legislation, if any, that's in, in progress to change the way we as a nation address the gaps and improve outcomes for um, positive and meaningful um, outcomes for children in foster care system. So um, does anyone wanna take on that? And we do have some allies in, in, the, um, in, in, the, uh, in, in Congress. And so, so Molly, you can't even off mute, you wanna? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking, cause of course there's Families First, which was landmark legislation that altered the face of child welfare for uh, generations to come It surely will. I think actually what's more important is the work we're seeing out of the Biden administration to include humans in the infrastructure plan, right? To put a stick in the ground and say, you know what, we're gonna have free pre-K and we're gonna have free community college because we care about our children this much in this country that that kind of access and I don't know that we're beginning to, this administration is prepared for us, prepared to get us to see those things as basic needs. 
um, and the um, lengths to which they're willing to go to support families who really struggled during COVID, uh, I think will probably do more because it will divert families from the downward trajectory they might be on. They may be now be able to spin out instead of landing at the rock bottom that is child protection. Instead, they'll perhaps be able to take a turn sooner um, before they need some kind of catastrophic intervention. Um, so I think those things are very promising. I do too, Molly. Um, I also think we have to be very um, aware of what's happening in state legislatures. Because uh, I know there's a movement to um, prevent uh, child welfare agencies from providing hormone replacement therapy for trans youth. Um, just all types of things that are very much not in the best interest of children. And so we have to really be aware of where politics and ideology is actually harming kids even more who are in foster care. Um, so it's both promoting the good stuff, but stopping the bad stuff from happening too. You know, and I, I wanna, because uh, we, many of us may be liberals on here, but I wanna talk about uh, a, if from a different perspective, a different paradigm. Let's say you're conservative. Let's say you're worried about the budget. Let's say you're worried about all of that. If you are a conservative, do you want to reduce the rate of crime? Do you want to reduce the rate of individuals in prison? Do you want to reduce homelessness? Spending a few dollars in early education, in community college, in programs to, that improve the foster care system, like making sure that somebody, uh, foster, uh, social workers are working and they don't get paid $16 an hour with very little benefits, especially in the non-for-profits. But if, if, you wanna, if you wanna look at it from the conservative viewpoint, then that's fine too, because everybody should be, uh, have a commonality of wanting to help our children and more importantly, wanting to help our society prevent the type of violence and criminal activity and, and uh, death and homelessness that results when you, when you abandon young individuals at their, at their weakest moment. And Jay, I would push that just a little further up the stream to say also to support families and communities, to build stronger families and build stronger communities to prevent children from coming into the foster care system, right? Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I think if I think if we start at the very, you know, like what about the starting at the very beginning? How do we support? What are some of the initiatives that maybe people have seen to support families or ways that those who are listening to us can think about in their own communities how to support families who may be struggling, um, so and maybe reaching out or can have a need versus always calling the child welfare system? Are there other things that we can do as communities to support those families? Any thoughts on that? I've always had this dream of having parental coaches, like yes. these coaches and mentors for parents so that they can become the lifelong mentors for their own children, right? And so if I think about one of the most insightful things for me in my development of understanding of the system was connecting really closely with my son's biological mother who grew up in foster care and started having children at early ages and had no supports around her. And just seeing how the system bulldozed over her uh, was awful. Trying to intervene, still getting crushed. I mean, unbelievable. And so if parents, parenting is the hardest thing you can do. And it's the one thing that we don't provide a lot of support for. And so, you know, whether it's faith communities, civic organizations, like if they could come together and mentor young parents, it would just be so powerful. That's a great point. There, is some, there are some great programs. The Parents as Teacher program is a, a, a fairly decent program. We have to be careful not to, some states are using that though to, and you probably know this, Karen and Molly, are using that to replace uh, what social workers, in other words, hire somebody who's not. I think it, you're talking though, I'm, I'm pretty sure Karen, about an, uh, an adjunct or adding it onto proper social work and so forth. And I think that that's 
hundred percent right. We need to have these parents or individuals, mentors that really can help uh, guide kids in, in uh, through the judicial system in their lives. And at the same time, who better to do that than people with a social work background, right? That's right. So That's right. Reimagine, like we're all we're over here reimagining public safety. Could we really reimagine child welfare in a way that the system ch shifts gears, and it really is more about providing the supports, not being the agency to remove and just refer? Uh, because I know that people that go to so schools of social work, that's what they want to do. They want to get in yep. there and really work with families. And unfortunately, they get into some systems and it just becomes a churn um, and they're not fulfilled. And I think that also leads to some of the turnover that you talked about. Yeah, and, and Molly's point about it's, it, it is infrastructure, isn't it? Social workers are building, they're building families and um, uh, improving the system, the, the foster care system or the, the child welfare system, I should say, overall is infrastructure. We have to invest in our, our kids. It, it, it's just that simple. Yeah, I would say we have to invest in our kids and in our in our, in our families, right? And, yeah. and as you point out before, in our social workers um, in real meaningful ways that would have better outcomes for our um, the children, the families and the system as a whole. And so I think one of the questions, and this may take us a little place different um, in the chat that, I'm sorry, in the question and answer came up is, is really around restorative and transformative justice and ways that you see that that possibly could fix the system. You know, it leads out just by saying that it's all so systematic. The school system is a pipeline to prison. Um, police in schools, locking up people of color and disproportionate numbers and biases. Any thoughts around restorative, restorative or transformative justice and how that potentially could help fix the system? Well, I, I think it could absolutely help fix the system because that happens at the very front end, right? And so if we're thinking about an incident of abuse or neglect is not a family's entire story. And it should not define an entire family and the next steps that occur. We should be encompassing everything that happens in that family, the good, the bad, the, you know, whatever it looks like. And so if you can use a restorative justice process to really center the family as a unit and as human beings, and not just as culpable bad people, um, I think that could go a long way to really sorting out who really needs to come into foster care and who just needs some extra support. So I love the idea. Um, they've also done some things around trauma uh, through some of those processes as well. And if you can start identifying, because some people don't even realize they're carrying trauma, whether it's a parent, a child, whoever, and if you can do some things up front to help identify and address the trauma, then the issue happening in that family uh, goes right with it. And so I do think, you know, there's a lot of discussions about two generation programs. Um, and there is that opportunity to work not only with the child, but with their parents, with their grandparents, their aunties, their entire social circle in a way that it really wraps them uh, and what they need. So I love, I love the idea. I do too. So as we begin um, to wrap up our discussion, which I think has been a wonderful discussion um, this evening, um, let's think about um, some of the key points or the key takeaways uh, that we want to make sure people leave with. And a couple of points and the things that I've seen in some of the questions that have come through uh, center around a couple of things. One is safety and making sure that our children who have to come in the foster care system are safe. And so 
what would you say would be some of the key things that we can do as a system to ensure the safety of children in our foster care system? Give them continuity, pay for, I'm gonna come back to pay proper uh, programs for, for foster care, like uh, allow um, one social worker for 15 children, no more than 15 children, enforce the DCFS uh, rules in with non-for-profits, um, which oftentimes are not, have a mechanism to, I'm being very specific, but I think that's what you're looking for, Carnitra. Um, have a, a, a system of checks and balances where we're examining the foster care agencies and making sure that they're complying with the regulations. Um, have a CASA presence in every state. Have also a GAL acting uh, for have an attorney appointed for every single child individually. And if, and that's just some of it, Re get rid of privatized foster care. I'm sorry. I, I, maybe there's some that are out there that are good, but I, I think if we can get rid of privatized prisons, which I also don't agree with uh, that we should have those, then certainly for children who, you know, have done nothing to um, nothing wrong should not have, we should not have privatized foster care. Those are some of the big issues I think that are facing us and, and have this and continue to have these kind of discussions on improving the overall um, delivery of services to foster kids and have better transitional programs for young individuals that are aging out of foster care so that we can reduce that damn statistic that is so awful and an embarrassment to our country. That's my two cents on what needs to be changed. That might've been 10 cents, Jay, but we're gonna take <laughs> 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 that one. <laughs> Matt, you wanna chime in or you want me to go to, Molly, I saw you come off mute. Yeah, I think I agree with everything on your list. And I guess I would also add back to Karen's opening question is if we were looking in the mirror is there some things that have to change that are over there? Regulations have to change, contracts have to change, totally. And also regulations and contracts are simply things that are made by people who are of a mind about things. And our country, the people in our country are of a particular kind of mind about kids in foster care. We tolerate less for them. We expect less for them. We presume less for them. And if we could, everyone on this call in our own minds decide only the best. And yep. if it's not good enough for my kid, then it's not good enough for those kids, right? Like, and if we could, if a sufficient number of people in this country could get into that stance, then I think that Jay, if you were successful at getting all of those wrong regulations and contracts out, then we wouldn't suffer the fate of just having them recreated by the next minds that came in to do stuff. Amen. Right? That's, right? Yeah. 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 And, and thinking about that, Molly, when you when uh, Karen made the earlier point about uh, community college education and treating them as our kids, I mean, why not really push and help uh, every state try to have a, a fund. I mean, we have Pell Grants and so forth. Can't we expand Pell Grants? To, that's treating these children, these young men and women as, as human beings. You know, one of the things that bothers me that I've seen, and, and hopefully they're changing this in some of the states, but you know, they, they used, when they moved a kid from home to home, they often gave them a garbage bag. And it's, it, you're, that goes along with what you're talking about thinking, Molly, our thinking. They gave them a garbage bag to put their things in. What does that say to the child about themselves if their things, their few things in the world are put into a trash bag? You know, I, I, we have to change our mindset. So you're 100% right there. I think we also have to just acknowledge the systemic racism involved in our system and in our thinking, right? So yeah. the disproportionate number of children in foster care are black and brown if upwards of 30% of teens in foster care are self-identifying as LGBTQIA, 
um, they are going to be seen as those children uh, when it comes to policymakers, when it comes to resources and everything else. And so I think we have to grapple with that. We have to grapple with uh, bias uh, in the system and toward these young children. Uh, because unfortunately, and we see the parallel in the criminal justice system, the opioid epidemic became a public health crisis. The war on drugs was a total criminalization of black and brown communities. And so we see the same thing happening with young people in the foster care system and even with parents and how they're treated in the foster care system. And so if you're coming in the door and you've got an opioid epidemic, your family has resources and you're getting into the mountain camp and getting your treatment, they're gonna treat you and your children very differently than the mother or father who can't afford that, who's not addicted to opioids, but to another street drug because they can't get the opioids and they have pain. Um, and so there's this ongoing circle and the over surveillance of poor and black and brown communities causes more children to come into care. And so we also have to be very careful with even Families First Act. We, that cannot be another portal for black and brown children to enter care because that's a lot of surveillance on the front end. And we gotta be really cautious about that and ensure that we're treating people equitably uh, no matter what their race or ethnicity. You know, Karen, you made a point when you talk about the opioid crisis, when did it really become a, a national problem where the nation started addressing it. And it goes to our, but when? Is when it started hitting the suburbs and the country, uh, uh, the countryside, you know, out in, in uh, the non-urban areas. It's been a problem in the urban areas for a while. But when it started hitting the white rural areas and the suburbs, that's when our country went, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And we've got to stop doing that as a nation. We have to say, wait a minute, the problem in the urban areas, the problems with black and brown children are our problems. Black problem with uh, Appalachian children is our problems. Problems with poor children is our problem. When we start doing that, then we're gonna get rid of that implicit and explicit biases that are going on, I think. And, and I will just so many hold on to say, I agree with everything. Um, and, you know, I think it really does come back to, to one of Molly's points is every child needs to be treated as if they were our own child. Um, and we need to provide unlimited resources to these children to become whole again and to families to become whole again. Um, and I think, you know, if we keep our, if we keep the children and the families at the soul of, of what the mission and the work is what we're doing is, is that's the best way we can protect them. Agreed. And so another question I'd like to pose to you all as we um, close out our discussion today, we have over 2000 persons viewing um, from all across the country. We have um, persons who are part of the foster care system in one role or another. We have persons who have survived the foster care system, um, persons who've aged out of the care system. And all of us have a uh, passion um, for improving the foster care system. All of us have an opportunity to do some type of advocacy for improving the foster care system. If there was one thing that you would say to an individual that's listening, to the nearly 2,000 persons that are listening, that they personally could do um, from their own position uh, to help improve our foster care system, what would that be? And it might not be one, maybe I'll give you some of you who might need more than one, you know, maybe one to three things. <laughs> I'll start by answering with uh, a, a website because then it can expand into about 10 different things. Our, uh, one of our producers, Peter Samuelson, has fixfostercare.org and it's a great, um, and it connects to the film and it also connects to the different services can connect you to CASA and other things and even uh, 
other programs that you can volunteer for. So fix, fixfostercare.org, I'll give you a, a more broad answer. Yeah, I would um, say, uh, especially, you know, all the social workers out there is we're often concerned about the most immediate crisis in front of us. And in, and that is all we can be concerned about. Um, it's often very important to look at the larger picture and to understand the legislation, the, the people that are at work and the things that are being done within your system. And how can you act as a larger voice and carry your voice up to that next advocacy level? Um, it, it's not easy to do, but until we talk about these larger systems as social workers and, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, you know, take, take, it, take a back seat to what's immediately in front of us just so we can understand why it's happening to us and what's happening to our families and children. I think that it's extremely important, but I, I want to say to all of the work, social workers and everybody on this call, you guys are already doing what you're supposed to be doing. You guys are, you guys are the front line. You guys are the workers. You guys are the people changing the system. So thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you guys do for children and families. We wouldn't be able to, to have a, such an important conversation if we didn't have people like you who are willing to listen, learn and move forward with for all the children and families. So thank you guys. Thank I'll, you, add my, I'll add my thanks, uh, Matthew. Uh, all that you do is so vital for ensuring that children are safe and well and thriving. Um, I would say no matter what your role is, find ways to put the humanity back into the process. So one of the things we realized during COVID is there are so many fragile families. The food insecurity in this country, the long lines during COVID just to get a box of food to feed your family. Um, and so we have to realize that families that come to the attention of the Child Welfare Agency and the children that come in are human beings who are, um, have, they have fragility, but they also have resiliency and they also have courage and talent and stick to itness and they have pain and they have trauma and all the things that being a human being brings and really leaning into that and connecting to people as human, I think can really start shifting mindsets about the needless separation of families or taking a traumatized child and charging them with a criminal offense because they acted out in a group home uh, it takes that out. We've got to start seeing these young people as human beings and their families. That was very well said, Ali. I think there are, there are two things that are both true and in conflict with one another. And they are that foster care is not working, it's broken. And also that there's nothing wrong with any of us. Right, And I think holding those two polarized concepts in our minds and in our hearts as we step into this matter a great deal because if we don't, if we don't concede that there's nothing wrong with any of us, then we begin from the place that there's something wrong with them. And if we begin from a place that there's something wrong with them, then we are rushing in to save them. And there's just not a lot of evidence that this, uh, here's what rushing in to save it makes you feel really good, but it doesn't actually have the outcomes that we've been talking about on this call tonight. And we do better to, as Karen says, lean into the knowledge that all boats rise and that rather than coming in to save, imagine there's nothing wrong with any of us and doing whatever you do next is to act in self-interest, right? To have all boats rise is better for you too. And if we hit at it that way, I imagine that we would reinvent child welfare as we know it. Wow, well said. Excellent. Thank you all 
Jay, there is a question in the chat around whether there will be additional movies um, around child welfare or a foster girl movie. So there's several of those questions in the chat, so. I would love there to be a foster girl movie. Um, I happen to have been dealing with more young men in my practice, so that's why I wrote that film. Um, but I guess I can tell you all that I'm working with Shaquille O'Neal on doing the series, and we're going to be, and I'm working with two tremendous writers, Jamal Joseph, who was one of the Black Panthers, um, and actually got his master's degree while he was in jail. He would tell you that, and now he's a professor of writing at Columbia, and he's also just got a recent gig. And then uh, uh, Trey Ellis, uh, an amazing writer as well. And so we're, we're working together to write the pitch. I've given them several drafts and they've chopped it up and hopefully, and rewritten some things. And so hopefully we'll be pitching that series to, um, first it goes to Shaquille, who he works with, which is TNT Warner Brothers. And if they say no, we're going to Netflix. But as Shaquille would say, not many people say no to Shaquille. So I, I think in the next year or so you'll, see a series. And my goal is to really make it authentic. And that's what I told them. I said, I want to be part of this only if you do not over Hollywoodize this. And if you true stick to the true points, and if we honor and embrace um, these young individuals, foster kids, um, and tell their stories the right way. That that's so yeah, we're doing it. Excellent. There's a lot of yeses and woes and exciting, looking forward to it in the chat. Well, so people are going to write. Um, I don't know who you'd write. It's not a congressman, but if you can write to TNT Warner Brothers <laughs> <laughs> and tell them to accept it. Uh, although I think he'll probably handle it. But, you know, yeah, thank you all. Hopefully we'll have it out. So as we conclude uh, tonight's discussion, I do want to thank our fine panelists for their sharing and their expertise and their passion around improving outcomes of our foster care system, improving the lives of our children and families who experience foster care. And we work tirelessly all of us who are part of the foster care system to just to do that. I know in my uh, over 15 years in a child welfare, just working directly in child welfare because I've worked in other parts of um, human services that you know my efforts have been to improve the outcomes of children in our systems. I've worked with Molly and Karen and we've all worked closely around those efforts and Matthew and Jay. And so thank you all for not just not tonight, but all that you've done in your careers and in your lives to bring um, to light the things that we need to change in the child welfare system. And thank you to all of those who have tuned in uh, tonight and have been part of this discussion and have kept the chat going. Um, with your comments. We appreciate you and we thank you for your advocacy. And we ask you to continue to advocate for improvement of the foster care system in this country. Um, our panelists gave you some good steps to do those things. And so thank you. Thank you to all of the social workers, to all of the foster parents, to all of the former foster youth. Continue to do what you do. Show up as yourself. Let's meet each other where we are, let's see each other for who we are, and let's work together to improve each other's lives in the systems that we uh, all work in. And so we wanna thank you again, and we want um, to thank uh, Jay's Law Firm for sponsoring this event. Um, and so we're really excited about that. If you have not had an opportunity to view the movie, please remember that it is playing on lots of video platforms such as Amazon, uh, DirecTV. So any of those uh, video platforms that are out there, please go to those on-demand platforms and view the movie Foster Boy and look for the next coming series. Or BET. 
Thank you, Dr. Or BET. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you all. I'm going to say good night. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Great group. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.